I think that the term UAV and drone is an interesting one. It's a uh, drone in particular is one that's come up recently and it's interesting to think about the history of it because what we call drones today have actually been around for a really long time. They used to be called remotely piloted vehicles and it was something that the military would use as, um, as a target, as a dummy and all that it meant is that the pilot was not inside the aircraft. And in a lot of cases today, um, especially in the military space, that's what UAVs are. They're just remotely piloted vehicles. But um, the A in UAV is aerial and not, uh, not autonomous. A lot of people, I think, confuse that a little bit. And the, the interesting thing about what's going on in UAV technology today is actually the autonomy. And what that means is uh, the aircraft makes decisions for itself. And this is autonomy is a topic that comes up in robotics in general. It's not just UAVs. It's in ground robots. It's in uh, underwater robots. And I think autonomy is probably one of the hardest concepts to understand about UAVs and robotics in general. And it's really the ability for these aircraft or ground robots or home robots to make decisions for themselves. So then you get into a question, what, what is a decision? So that decision might be, how should I steer myself so that I can go to a particular area, so that I can take a particular picture? Uh, that's kind of stuff that's been solved, and now we're looking at actually making decisions with uh, these robots and these aircraft. How should I go to a point? Why should I go to a point? Should I go to any point? What if you give it some just general task, like I want to take the best pictures possible of this area. How do I fly my aircraft so that I do that? Or I want to go look uh, for someone who's wandering and lost in the woods or lost out on the water. How do I search for that person? And it's those areas where autonomy is really useful and where it comes into play. And that's, that's what UAVs are being used for now today in research communities, but more and more in actual practical applications uh, for commercial enterprise, for military, and for hobbyists as well. So today, uh, UAVs are used in a wide variety of applications, and I think primarily the ones that people think of when they hear UAV, or especially the word drone, is they think about military applications. Um, and it, it's interesting because these unmanned aerial vehicles have been around for a long time and have been used for a wide variety of things, but it's really only the advent of things like the Predator drone that have brought people to think about them as these aircraft that are primarily used by the military. In fact, when the military uses them, uh, at least in the US, it's by and large not in weaponized contexts and by and large used in just surveillance applications. Um, and when drones are used in the regular world, uh, in commercial applications, they really have nothing to do with that. So I think that the term drone is kind of misunderstood and overloaded. If you were to ask you know, my mom what is a drone, she would say it's that scary thing you know, that the military uses. But in fact, they're doing all sorts of things. And we're starting to see that more and more in the news. You saw that Amazon now has this package delivery system that it's working on. And then there's the taco copter and all these things that are kind of these crazy ideas. But what I think that they speak to is the fact that, you know, much like what happened with the personal computer where it was at first a research thing and a military only technology, then, then people started to, that was computers in general, then people started to think about you know, what do we actually do with these? How do we actually make them work for us and do a particular task and make our lives easier? And that's where we're at now with UAVs. So at 3D Robotics, um, which is the company that I work for, we look at a wide variety of commercial, industrial, and personal applications for flying aircraft. I think what's, what's interesting about it and the perspective that we should have is that it really doesn't matter that it's a flying aircraft. Most people don't care that it's a flying aircraft. And most people don't care about the autopilot that's inside of them uh, because that's really just how it gets a task done. Just in the same way you don't really care about the controller board inside your washing machine. So um, here's an autopilot, it's $200. It, it actually, it's the brains inside the aircraft. And most people should never have to know what this is because what uh, a UAV is to a farmer or a construction worker or a hobbyist that wants to take pictures of themselves surfing as it's a flying camera or it's a flying survey tool. And that's, I think that's the important thing about where UAVs and robotics in general is going. It's going towards applications and what can we now do with these technologies now that we have them available to us and now that they're, they're readily accessible. You know, I think it's interesting thinking about what, what is happening right now in the world of robotics and the world of UAVs that's allowing these trends to happen. And, it's a similar question to what happened to personal computers. How did Apple become this company that it is 
what were the enabling technologies that went to it? And for UAVs, it's, it's really simple. It's, it's the thing that we have in our pocket, it's this. So we have uh, these incredibly powerful computers in our pocket. And this thing has a gyroscope, an accelerometer, a compass, multiple barometers in some cases, a GPS. And the intelligence that goes into this and the cheap sensors that go into making your phone work are exactly the thing that's driving UAV innovation. And it's driving it so fast and driving prices down so much that we now have $200 autopilots, like the one uh, that I showed. So we have these $200 autopilots. And what's amazing is that once you start to make a $200 autopilot, then you start to have something like sub thousand dollar drones or UAVs. And then you can start uh, putting them in the hands of people who actually want to do work with them. And then you start to create with them. So uh, it wasn't until computers became very cheap and became very personal that there was all this explosion of innovation around computers and people doing incredibly creative things with them. And that's what's going on in robotics right now. And that's what's going on uh, in the UAV space. So we can talk about aerial imaging. We could talk about uh, disaster monitoring, forest fire prevention, all of these applications that are now becoming possible because UAVs are becoming cheap. The technology is becoming readily available. And I think in 10, 10 maybe even five years from now, we're not even going to talk about uh, the autopilot anymore. We're not even going to talk about the brains in the same way that we don't talk about the motor control that's inside your drill or the controller board that's inside your washing machine. It just, it just does what it does. And for those companies, it's, it's just marketing at this point. And what the washing machine does is wash clothes. And what, what a UAV is going to do for you is who knows what. It's going to monitor forest fires. It's going to do all sorts of applications. So uh, people always ask, you know, what, are, what are they useful for? And you can answer that question in, in kind of two ways. You can say, well, what are, what are the areas right now that manned aircraft are used? They're used in crop dusting, forest fire prevention, all sorts of aerial imaging applications, search and rescue applications. So that's easy. We can say like, okay, there's those applications and those are going to become cheaper. They're going to become more accessible for more people. There might be more forest fire monitoring services out there because more people can buy these aircrafts. Uh, different industries will become more efficient. Those kind of make sense. But there's also, a, I think, a broader pool of applications that don't even happen now because people have never had a cheap aircraft. So people have never had the ability in much the same way that computers didn't exist in people's homes um, 30 years ago. And now they're in everyone's home. They're in everyone's pocket. So I guarantee that in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there's going to be a set of applications that we're going to say, oh, yeah, it, it makes sense that UAVs are taking pictures on farms. But there's going to be a bigger set of applications that if we look at it now, we would say, you know, I never thought of that happening because uh, we just, we, we're just not going to know what the technology can do until we put it out there in the hands of creative, inventive people and they start doing creative, inventive things with it. The way that the technology behind UAVs works is uh, it's, it's actually a conglomeration of many technologies, just like it is in all, in all robotics. So in aerial robotics, we have aircraft which have existed for a while. The new things that are happening there is small, foldable airframes, uh, tiny airframes, uh, airframes made out of new materials that are more resistant to crashes. That's on the small aircraft space. And then there's, there's innovations going on in aerodynamics um, all the time. But aerodynamics is a fairly mature area. And it's not really progressing quite at the speed of uh, where the autopilot is. So we now have these, these autopilots. This is uh, a Pixhawk. It's, a, it's an autopilot made by 3D Robotics. And it has an ARM processor inside of it. It um, has multiple input-output ports. It has a compass. It has an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a GPS. Uh, and it takes all of these sensor inputs and fuses them together to figure out where the aircraft is in the world. That's, that's half of what goes on inside the autopilot, the sensing part. That's new technology in some cases. And it's especially new in the areas where it's become inexpensive. Autopilots have existed for a while, but not $200 autopilots that anyone can use. So the other half of that, that's the sensing part. The, the other half is the actual control part. So now that we know where this thing is in space and where the aircraft is, how do we actually control it to tell it to level out? How do we control it to tell it to go to a particular waypoint? How do we even control it to tell it to take images over a whole area? So those are all different topics in control theory. And um, the autopilot is constantly, every 400 times a second, uh, 1,000 times a second, is figuring out the right control inputs to write to the motors. So it's telling it exactly how to move the ailerons so to stabilize itself. 
and it can do incredible things. You can put an aircraft up and it can stay in 30, 40 miles an hour of wind. It can just hover there. You could take a fixed wing aircraft and you can fly it great, great distances, have it stabilize itself in, in a lot of wind, which is incredible for small airframes that might not be as well made as a, as a rigid, more expensive airframe. It's incredible that we have that ability to both figure out where it is in space and actually control it in a meaningful way to actually stabilize it and actually make it fly and do the right thing and do what the human intends. Um, there's probably a third part of that, which is, I think, often overlooked uh, as far as the technology that goes into this, and that's the user interface. And that's just as much a technology as is the, uh, the sensing and the estimation and the control. So the user interface is what does the person see and what does the operator of the aircraft and the person who wants to get work done, what do they see and how do they interact with the aircraft? And there's all sorts of user interfaces. Some are better than others. And it's actually a really hard problem to make a user interface that's, that's going to work well for uh, a farmer and a construction worker and people who might not necessarily want to know about how does a compass work and how do I set this up. So interestingly enough, I think a lot of the innovations that are happening here right now are in the space of simplifying the setup procedure and simplifying the tuning procedure because it can be cumbersome to get one of these and put it on your aircraft or buy an aircraft and then you have to do all sorts of tuning based on where you are in the world and what altitude you're flying at. So making the aircraft smart enough and aware enough of where it is and how it should control itself so that when I take it and fly it in Berkeley, California, or if I fly it in Moscow or wherever I fly it, at whatever altitude and whatever environmental conditions, it's going to work um, and it's going to work reliably.